Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, new support for a San Diego lawmaker's police reform bill. That we are Californians and the reputation or the data that we have about the number of shootings in California is unacceptable. It is not what we believe is a golden state. Families affected by deadly police shootings rally behind Shirley Weber's push to change the use of deadly force and regulating rent hikes, how a new push to address California's cost of living would affect tenants and landlords. If I feel like interacting, there's somebody to talk to because I think if I lived alone, I may never see anybody else. For some of California's seniors, growing older also means finding a roommate. The financial and social reasons behind the housing trend. Hey, I want to grow cannabis. I'm like, okay, well, do you have seven or eight million laying around to get it done? The business of growing cannabis. See how local companies are entering a new industry that's already changing. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Monday, May 13th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Mothers from across California rallied in Sacramento today. They want to change how and when police can use deadly force. They're part of a group that have lost loved ones to violent encounters with police. San Diego Assemblywoman Shirley Weber is trying to pass Assembly Bill 392. It would change the official guidelines for law enforcement agencies when it comes to use of force. And we have to have the right spirit to basically create an environment in California where everyone feels protected by law enforcement. That law enforcement is truly our friend. Uh, the people who come and to make things better, not to make things worse. This is the second time Weber is trying to pass the bill. A strong opposition from police groups stalled her efforts last year. The district attorney says two San Diego police officers were justified in firing shots during a shootout in the college area last year. And now body cam video is being made public. The video shows sh several shots being fired towards firefighters and police. They were responding to a disturbance call with a smell of smoke. Two police officers were shot. Both have recovered. The shooter was wounded by police bullets, but the medical examiner says he died from a self-inflicted wound. San Francisco might become the first city in the country to ban the use of facial recognition technology by police. City leaders will vote on the proposal tomorrow. Privacy advocates say the technology could put people in police lineups without their knowledge. The state is also considering a ban on facial recognition when it comes to police body cameras. Nearly a year and a half into legal marijuana sales, the economics are changing. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman shows us how growers are adjusting their business plans. What well, makes a good bud? I mean, obviously there are a lot of questions. What strain is it? You know, what's the flavor going to be and so forth? Lincoln Fish is taking us on a tour inside the building where he grows cannabis in East San Diego County. High pressure sodium lights give this room its yellow color. This would be called a very frosty uh, nug here with all those little white things or trichomes. It looks kind of like snow. Um, that's going to have, this one's going to have a lot of flavor and a lot of oil out of it. Fish is CEO of Outco Labs, which grows hundreds of cannabis plants at a time. The buds in this room are almost ready to harvest. We're going to cut them down by the, down by the base here. Um, and then we're going to take this out and we're actually going to hang it upside down. It's, the drying process is very important to get the dry right, to get the water activity level right, and so forth. Outco isn't your typical cannabis business. It grows, manufactures, and sells cannabis products at its own dispensaries. Outco also wholesales cannabis to retailers across Southern California. We sell the 60 dispensaries plus. We'll be in over 200 by the end of the year. Outco has its own line of products, including concentrates and vapes, items that Fish says are growing in demand. You aren't getting a lot of new smokers. As you get new entrance to the market, they typically go to concentrates. They go to vapes or other concentrated products or they go to edibles. That's, that's the direction that they're going to go. You're not going to create, people who didn't smoke before aren't suddenly going to take up smoking because cannabis became legal, you know, and we're seeing that. We're seeing the flower as a percentage of the total sales, we're seeing that drop. So what you're going to see is a lot of plants that are grown to maximize how they might come out in an extraction, for example. Growing cannabis indoors allows for a higher quality product, but it's expensive. You're basically creating a natural environment in a highly controlled way. 
There's lighting, air circulation, filtering, water, pest, and labor considerations. Fish believes as more growers come in, the cannabis growing process will change. But I really believe that the days of the indoor grow, except for very specific niche kind of stuff, I think they're kind of numbered. I think we're going to see a lot of price compression to grow indoors, and you'll hear different numbers from different people, but let's call it between five and $600 a pound is your cost to grow. To grow in a uh, sophisticated light deprivation, light supplementation greenhouse where you're using the power of the sun is more like $250 a pound, right? Um, I think that's the future of the industry. Greenhouses are how Mike Milano plants to grow cannabis. Where we will have hard walls, clear roof, uh, light deprivation, so we'll be able to black out the light completely. Milano's family owns and operates a farm in the city of Oceanside. Milano Enterprises grows things like flowers and filler plants, just like this Israeli Ruskis here. Two years ago, the company CEO, he left his position to pursue growing cannabis. I just saw it as an uh, opportunity that I don't think we'll see again. It's just a brand new industry, and it intrigued me. It interested me. There's way more gross margin in cannabis than there is in cut flowers. Milano has been in the agriculture business for most of his life and says cannabis is just another crop. I have a, a background of running large-scale ag operations, right? Cultivation of cannabis is just an ag operation, right? The fact that we're growing the taboo plant of cannabis is irrelevant. You just, it's, it's environmental controls, pest control, pest management, process management, labor management, all the same things that make you successful in a business like this make you successful in cannabis. It's taken two years, but Milano just received a permit from the city of Oceanside to start growing cannabis. It's been a challenge to, to work through the political process of all this. Now he faces a state licensing process. Milano says it's a huge investment to start a cannabis growing operation. I think it's really difficult for a smaller uh, group that just wants to jump in now or just an individual is like, hey, I want to grow cannabis. I'm like, okay, well, do you have seven or eight million laying around to get it done? or do you have a year or two to do the political process? It's when you start asking the questions around what it actually takes, uh, good luck. Got to keep the air circulating. The, the air circulating helps really keep the plants healthy. Outco's Fish agrees. He says the cannabis industry isn't the cash cow it's made out to be. It's far more difficult to make money in cannabis than most people realize. And ultimately, it's going to be just like any other business in terms of, in terms of you have to you, know, you have to do things efficiently. You have to watch your margins. You have to, you know, create a, a real business infrastructure. Then there's the whole issue of competing with the black market. Every legal operator will, will tell you that um, they aren't doing nearly as well as they could because of the black market. Illegal grows aren't under any regulation and are avoiding taxes that legal operators face. I'm happy to pay those taxes. I'm all for it. But it's got to be, it's got to coincide with making it more difficult for the other guy. The problem with that whole black market piece is they're using stuff all over the place. They're making products that they don't care about things like how much lead is in a vape cartridge or, you know, what, what uh, pesticides went with it. They just don't care. Fish says he hasn't seen a lot of enforcement from the state on cannabis. Just recently, California found it received lower tax revenue than originally projected. Fish says to see that revenue grow, illegal operators need to be shut down. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. As Matt Hoffman just said, the money generated by marijuana taxes is not as high as the state projected. The shortfall is more than $200 million through 2020. Governor Newsom is urging more cities and counties to allow cannabis businesses to operate. The state is still trying to fully implement a track and trace system to keep illegal products out of stores. While in San Diego last week, the governor talked to KPBS about the delay. I just got here. I'm inheriting this. We're going to fix this. And it's going to take five to seven years. I've said this for the last two years. I said, everyone be patient here. No one is patient. The governor says enforcement of illegal businesses will be stepped up. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the news, our trade tensions rise and markets stumble as China imposes retaliatory tariffs on U.S. made goods. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. A bill that would limit rent increases in California is one step closer to becoming law. KPBS reporter Priya Shreether says it aims to stop rent gouging. 
Tenants at this building in City Heights were notified last month that their rents would be increasing by 75% in July. Most of them said the hike was too high and they'd have to find a new place to live. But increasing the rent that much is perfectly legal in San Diego, as long as landlords give tenants the required amount of notice. That could all change if Assembly Bill 1482 becomes law. The reason why this is so important to me is because it's about fairness. Ginger Hitsky is an affordable housing developer. She says it should be illegal for developers to buy poorly maintained properties, fix them up, and then skyrocket the rent. My biggest issue is with um, folks who are buying up existing apartment complexes that have a potential upside for rent. So they'll go in, they'll throw in a new kitchen, they'll throw in some new flooring, paint the walls gray, throw, you know, put some of that... Uh, you know, that wood siding on the side that looks real, you know, architecturally cute and and just immediately jack up the rent. What value did that just add to society? What did you really do? You, you didn't do anything. You just you found an, an opportunity in the market and you exploited it. Hitsky backs the new bill, which says that landlords cannot increase rents more than 5 percent per year, plus the rate of inflation. But some think the bill doesn't do enough. Catherine Mendonca is an organizer with San Diego Tenants Union, a group based in City Heights that advocates for tenants' rights. Even if uh, tenants are facing an 8% increase, uh, let's say that's the 5% plus the inflation of the in uh, due to the anti-gouging bill, that still can be detrimental if somebody is having to pay out of pocket for medical expenses, um, for food, for transportation, um, for pretty much li just regular living expenses. The bill has been advanced to the California Assembly floor for a vote. If it passes, it will need approval from the state Senate and the governor to become law. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. It's not just financial need that forces seniors to change their living situation. Loneliness is another factor. As part of the California Dream Project, KPBS reporter Amitha Sharma met two San Diego seniors who are choosing to live together. I think about them, but I don't, you know, really go and look at them a lot. At 95, Eleanor Stone has outlived her husband, three children, and four siblings. I'm all alone. I don't have anybody. That reality prompted the retired school cafeteria worker to move a roommate into her San Diego home in 2013. No hard figures exist, but growing numbers of California seniors are opting to move in with each other for companionship and financial reasons. That's a, a trend that we've seen growing in the last few years. Um, seniors who have lived in apartment buildings for decades and the rents keep going up, they're on fixed income, so there's no way for them to make up that difference. Anya De La Cruz, associate director of Elder Help, which matched up Stone with a roommate, says California's affordable housing crisis is straining the elderly's finances to a point where living alone is a luxury. Rent combined with events that tend to happen as people grow older can be overwhelming. It could be that they're recently widowed. It could be that they were sick, you know, and they've spent a lot of money on their medical care. They've wiped out their savings. Um, so it's really those life events. I think we hear a lot of times, I never thought that I would be in this position. I, I don't know what affordable housing is. I don't know what Section 8 is. This is the first time that I've ever had to think about that in my life, and I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Um, you know, it, it's looking like I might be homeless. As in the case of Eleanor's roommate, 68-year-old Rose McGeehee. I was living in my own apartment, and, um, I, the, you know, and I, I hadn't been able to find work, and the, the uh, money was just going, and I knew I wasn't going to make the next month's rent. Pairing up the elderly who have long-established likes and dislikes isn't easy. Elder Help reports the average time their pairings last is three years. McGeehy and Stone credit their six years together to space. Stone first. We get along good. I mean, she does her thing and I do my thing and my cat does her thing. <laughs> McGeehy likes that Stone doesn't, in her words, crowd her too much. I am an introvert and strongly an introvert. And for us, we build energy by being alone. 
when we go out and we're in groups of people, then our energy feeds off and I get frantic. So then I have to come home and be totally alone, shut the door. The two have different schedules. McGeehee rises early, eats breakfast, works until 2 p.m., and then watches something on Netflix in the afternoon. Stone wakes up at 8.30 a.m., grabs a coffee and the newspaper. First I read the sports section, then I read Dear Dabby, then the uh, jumble. Then Stone has breakfast. She also likes to try out new recipes in the afternoon, but the roommates don't cook together. Eleanor's a wonderful cook, but she's not gluten-free. <laughs> so. McGeehee, who used to work in IT, helps Stone with computer questions and takes her to doctor's appointments. And I know I can count on her. McGeehee says she likes living with Eleanor. If I feel like interacting, there's somebody to talk to because I think if I lived alone, I may never see anybody else. Yeah. You know? But would she choose living with someone else if she had more money? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. And for Stone, having McGeehee live with her hasn't warded off the loss of her family. I'm still lonely, you know. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. You can find more stories from the statewide public media collaboration at kpbs.org slash dream. An Emmy-winning actress says she committed fraud as part of the nationwide college admissions scandal. Felicity Huffman pleaded guilty today in federal court. Prosecutors are asking for four to ten months in prison. She's among 14 parents pleading guilty. Others are fighting the charges. Huffman admits to paying money to have someone correct her daughter's SAT answers. This year, 10 California students were selected for the Presidential Scholarship. This is the nation's top award for high-achieving graduating high school seniors. There are only two in San Diego, and they join us now. Michael Chin, In, and Lou, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. So what was your reaction when you found out that there's only 161 students selected out of more than 3.5 million graduating seniors? What was your reaction when you found out that you were part of that list? Well, it's a huge honor for me. I was very excited when I found out about it, but at the same time, um, I'm very proud to represent CCA as a presidential scholar in the arts for my school. So Michael, how are people at school reacting to the fact that you were both selected this year? Oh, they're, they're very surprised, and I'm very surprised too that um, we we're both from the same school and we got selected. I think that's not very often happens that two students from the same school are selected. So it was very shocking initially and we we're very happy. And so you guys actually knew each other before being honored in this way. Has it made the process easier or how does it feel to go through it together? Um, well, because we were friends before and we knew each other before and uh, when we received this news, we we're both very excited about it. So because it's just cool to have someone you know to go to um, the award ceremony with. Yeah, it's fun to share the honor together. And Michael, you're being recognized for achievement in academics. What did it take to get to this point? They selected the scholars initially based off of one of the standardized testing scores. So I got a perfect score on the ACT uh, test. And then I think they also combined other achievements in academics, such as grades and um, the like difficulty of the courses that you're taking. And what about your personal sacrifice to get to this point? How much studying did you have to do in order to achieve a, a perfect score? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely um, have to balance out my schedule a lot to uh, figure out like when I can fit in times to study. There's not always like a concrete. I can't always like schedule uh, perfectly when I want to study, when I want to like hang out, or when I want to do other extracurriculars, I kind of have to figure out as I'm going. Um, so yeah, and it's a, it's a lot of, it's kind of a hustle to uh, prepare, to constantly be thinking about preparing and to constantly be studying. Now, we just saw as a nation a, um, a college admission scandal. Um, lots of students have a lot of pressure to get into these top universities. Are you aware that students your age are under this type of pressure or, or what's your experience? 
Yeah, we definitely feel, uh, I do at least with, along my, with my friends and other students, um, there is, especially at my school, a, like a growing pressure on students. Um, like the mindset of my friends and other students in classes is they're all focused on, they're like college oriented. Um, all, they take classes that they don't like just to get into some colleges because like they think that the colleges might like to see them. Um, so it is very like focused on college and it kind of does take away um, when from like having like when you're trying to have like a social life. Like. As two kids graduating from high school, um, you're just most recently exposed to it. What do you think would be the best format for for reaching kids and and giving them a quality education? Um, I think, well, adding on to before what he said, um, because we go to Kenyon Crest Academy and it's ranked number one in, Calif in the state of California. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the pressure is uh, huge. And a lot of the kids, they're very, very stressed. And I think right now society has focused more on the honor, this word honor in many ways, like the honor of getting into a good college, the honor of, you know, as an artist being on stage. Right. And I think the solution for that is we should direct our focus away from the honor of achievement, but instead of the fruit of knowledge that we receive through the achievement. So what's next for, for both of you? Where are you going to college? Do you have any idea what you're gonna study? Yeah, I'm heading to Yale University and I'm going to study computer science there. Congratulations. And I'm uh, heading off to both Columbia University and the Juilliard School. Amazing, congratulations. So I'm sure we'll be hearing about great things, more great things in your futures. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the day today. The weather, not bad. It's kind of chilly, a little bit below average in some locations, but it is dry, and we had plenty of sunshine much of the afternoon. Now, to the north of us, we're going to see a parade of storms again this week. You could see some of the cloud coverage moving in to northern California, not having an impact on us, not yet. Things are going to change toward the end of this week. So for tonight, we're at 62 degrees for the low. Increasing clouds throughout the night. They'll be around in the morning. And then they break off and we have that sunshine by the afternoon. So Oceanside reaching 57 for the low tonight. El Cajon at 60 degrees. And in Borrego Springs, 69 degrees, mostly clear. It's looking good tomorrow. Lots of sunshine around here. It's going to be warming up, still trending right around average for the temperatures. But certainly a nice dry day ahead of us. 72 in, in uh, San Diego, in Ramona, 81 degrees, and Chula Vista at 72. Further east, expect to see a pleasant day in Mount Laguna with sunshine. Borrego Springs up to 97 degrees. So expect to see sunshine through Wednesday. Temperatures then drop to the 60s. It's going to be breezy with rain on Thursday for the coast. Showers in the morning, drier by Saturday with sunny skies. Inland, expect to see rain and breezier conditions Thursday as well. We're down to 65 degrees for the high. Showers left over in the morning, but drier and sunny by the afternoon with pleasant conditions on Saturday, reaching 72 degrees. Sunshine in the deserts through Wednesday. Look at the change in temperatures, pretty drastic. We go from the 90s all the way down to 76 degrees on Thursday. You're gonna feel that. It's gonna remain pretty pleasant throughout the rest of the weekend. And in the mountains, we'll see breezy conditions, much cooler with rain Thursday into Friday, nicer by Saturday. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you. One of the Navy's newest ships is being named after civil rights leader and Georgia Congressman John Lewis. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman shows us how Lewis visited San Diego today to help begin its construction. John Lewis has dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he calls the beloved community. The Navy's latest class of oilers is being named That's after Congressman Lewis. If someone had told me when I was growing up in rural Alabama, or during the height of the civil rights movement, that one day I would have a series of ships named after me. I would say, you're crazy. We'll get this started. The first ship in the fleet is named the USNS John Lewis and is sponsored by actress Alfre Woodard. So now it's time to uh, put uh, Congressman Lewis and Alfre Woodard to work. Monday, Lewis and Woodard were at NASCO shipyard for a keel laying ceremony. 
formally kicking off construction. <laughs> Lewis also welded his initials on a steel plate that will go on the ship. Lewis hopes that when future generations see his name on the ship, they will look back at his fight for civil rights. And see what I tried to do as a teenager and in my 20s and my 30s to make America better and to make our world better. Hello, everybody. Lewis says the diversity of the crew building the ship is inspiring. They're black, they're white, they're Latino, they're Asian American, they're Native American. If, if people can come together and build a ship to travel the sea, why we can't come together as a people? Construction on the ship named after Lewis is scheduled for completion late next year. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.